are in this series called The Choice. Uh, uh, as we go through the season of Lent, it's a season of self-examination and looking deeply uh, at ourselves that leads up to Easter. Uh, if you have a Bible or a Bible app, you can find Luke chapter 15. It'll be uh, looking at some verses in that chapter uh, this morning. Uh, we are about one and a half weeks away from the premier event of the 2019 professional golf season. Now, I realize only about 5% of you care about that. But it will begin on August 11th down in Augusta, Georgia, the Masters Tournament. Somebody likes golf. And it will, uh, it will uh, take place at Augusta National Golf Club. Now, um, Augusta National Golf Club is probably the most famous golf club in the United States. It is also notoriously the most difficult golf club in the United States to, uh, to join, to become a member of. In fact, you can only become a member when you are invited by a member of the board of directors. And they only invite people to become members because another member has died. So in order for you to get into Augusta National into membership, somebody else has to have come to their timely or untimely demise because there's only a certain number of memberships to be had. Now, if you're going to, if you're, if you want to get into Augusta National as a member, it helps to have won not one, not two, not three, but at least four Masters tournaments. Only two out of about 65 Masters champions have ever been asked to become members of Augusta National. Arnold Palmer, who won four Masters in the late 50s and 60s, and Jack Nicklaus, who won six Masters over about a two-decade period. Tiger Woods and some of the other famous golfers you know of have never been invited to join Augusta National. Of course, if you want to get into Augusta National, it helps to have money. Uh, uh, Bill Gates and Warren Buffett uh, are members of Augusta National, but hey, the $20,000 a year annual fee is no big deal for them, right? Uh, but it helps to have money. Uh, if you want to join Augusta National, probably the worst thing you can do for your chances of getting in is to look like you want to get in or make it known that you would like to be a member. Looking desperate to get in is, is a surefire way to never be invited to get into Augusta National. Like if they invite you to get in, you have to go, oh, I've never thought about joining before. You know, like, you have to kind of act that way about it. Um, as a matter of fact, it wasn't until 1990 that African Americans or people of non-Caucasian skin could be members of Augusta National. It's a little worse for women. It wasn't until 2012 that women could be invited to become members of Augusta National, at which point former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice broke two barriers at once, becoming the first African American female member of Augusta National. She was the first woman they invited uh, to, uh, to join. Now, all of this to say that um, Augusta National, their members and their board of directors work really, really hard to make sure that outsiders stay outside and only insiders get inside. As a matter of fact, to my knowledge, almost every one of us in this room could stand outside of the gates to Augusta National and shake them back and forth or clang a metal cup against them, trying to get in. And the only thing we would actually get inside of is a police cruiser in a jail cell. Right? They just work really hard at keeping outsiders outside and making sure insiders are the only people who get inside. Now, it just so happens that back in the first century, a lot of the Jewish religious leaders, not all of them, but a significant number of them kind of treated their Jewish religion, their Jewish faith, like the board at Augusta National treats their golf club. They wanted to make sure that outsiders stayed outside of the Jewish faith and religion, and they wanted to make sure that only insiders were inside of the Jewish faith and religion. And I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but when, it, when any group of, of when any group of, of faith people, no matter what their faith is typically, but especially with Christians or Jewish folks, whenever they become exclusionary of other people, you can almost always bet that they are highlighting certain passages of Scripture over other passages of Scripture. So there are plenty of passages in the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, where God talks about inviting outsiders to come inside, taking care of foreigners and widows and orphans and people who are on the outside of the nation of Israel. But these religious leaders like to just avoid those and pretend like they were not there to focus on some of the verses that talked about how they needed to be careful 
about who became a member of their community. So they probably loved a verse like Deuteronomy 21, 21. You must purge the evil from among you. Make sure outsiders stay outside and only insiders get inside. I imagine they really, really liked the first verse of Psalm 1. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers. Keep the outsiders outside. Make sure the insiders are the only ones who get inside. The religious leaders were really hung up with this group of people that they might have called wicked, that they might have occasionally called mockers or scoffers, but that they more often than not just referred to as sinners. Now, this group that they referred to as sinners included certain types of people. So when they referred to sinners, they were talking about pickpockets and thieves. They were talking about racketeers and swindlers. They were talking about gamblers and prostitutes. And most of all, they tended to be talking about tax collectors. They really honed in on tax collectors. And you may be wondering why. I mean, like, nobody likes an IRS agent, right? But unless you're married to them. But there are probably some IRS agents out there who are good, God-loving, God-fearing, God-loving people. So why were the religious people always picking on the tax collectors and lumping them with the sinners? Well, because the tax collectors worked for the Romans. And the Romans were oppressors. So if you were a tax collector, you were a Jewish person who was working on behalf of the Roman oppressors to raise taxes off of your own Jewish people. And the Roman government set a certain percentage that you had to collect from everybody, but then they allowed you pretty much to determine your own percentage of what you were going to add to that to make your own money. And so nobody liked a tax collector because they were taking advantage of their own people on behalf of the enemy. As a matter of fact, the kind of people who became tax collectors, they were already swindlers and racketeers before becoming tax collectors. Because you had to sort of be a tax collector, you had to be the kind of person who didn't care how you made your money so long as you made your money. Just so long as you could get it. So you've got the pickpockets and the thieves and the swindlers and the racketeers and the gamblers and the prostitutes and the tax collectors. And these were the group that they included in the centers. Now listen, all of these people in this group, they refined the definition of partying hard. If you look up hard partying anywhere, there should be a picture of some of the people in this center group listed by the definition. They really honed it in. They made hard partying a skill par excellence. They were just really, really good at it. And Jesus went to a lot of their parties. I mean, he called the tax collector to be one of his followers. This guy named Levi, more commonly known as Matthew, who's a tax collector. Jesus says, come and follow me. Matthew says, I'm going to come and follow you. But then before he can go on his journey with Jesus, Matthew, the tax collector, throws a party for Jesus. Can you imagine what kind of party it was? Pickpockets, thieves, swindlers, and racketeers, and gamblers, and prostitutes, and fellow tax collectors. And Jesus gets invited to the party. And Jesus went to it. A few chapters later, he walks into a town. There's all kinds of people that have come out to see Jesus. Guess who he picks to have dinner with? A little short guy named Zacchaeus, who is a tax collector, a sinner. Jesus was always hanging out with sinners. And what made this really, really bad for the religious leaders is that he was always eating with them. Because you know, as well as I do, that you can tell a lot about a person by the company they keep when they eat. Right? We know a lot about you just by you, who you take your meals with. And here's Jesus eating with the sinners and the tax collectors. This really, this really bothered the religious leaders. Because they knew, they had experienced that Jesus knew the Hebrew Bible backward and forward, inside and out, better than any of them knew it, and they were the experts in the Bible. They had heard Jesus teach. They didn't like to talk about it, but they knew that Jesus could teach the Bible backwards and forwards, inside and out, better than any of them could teach it, and they were the experts in it. They didn't like that Jesus had healed people, like had made lame people walk, made blind people see. 
They didn't like that Jesus had done any of that, but they also knew that that was the kind of stuff God hadn't done in Israel for several hundred years, not since the age of prophets like Elijah and Elisha, and here's Jesus doing it. They knew that people were saying Jesus was the Messiah, and they might have been totally down with Jesus, except that he partied with sinners, and they would say he can't be the Messiah. Because he parties with sinners. He might know the Bible. He might teach it well. He might heal some people. But he has to be a charlatan, a fake, a fraud. He might be working for the devil, actually. Because if he was all of those things and could legitimately do them on behalf of God, he wouldn't be making outsiders think that they could actually be insiders on the kingdom of God. He just can't be. So Jesus didn't win any gold stars with the religious leaders. But he became quite the celebrity with all the sinners. <laughs> so that wherever he went, there they were. And, and at one point, Luke, who's one of Jesus' four reputable biographers, Luke just says this. Now, tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. It's like, this is Luke's idea. Whenever there was a crowd around Jesus and you looked in that crowd, you had to look hard to find the fine, reputable, religious, middle-class people. Because everywhere you looked, there was a pickpocket, there was a thief, there was a racketeer, there was a swindler, there was a gambler, there was a prostitute, there was a tax collector. You went into a crowd that was gathered to hear Jesus, that's who you were rubbing shoulders with. And then, of course, the religious leaders were there. But not too close. Not too close. They were there when Jesus was often gathered to teach. They wouldn't get too close to this crowd because all these people are unclean sinners. Don't stand in the way of the wicked, right? Don't be with them. But they get close enough to stage whisper. You know what a stage whisper is? It's like if my wife Kira were here and I stood up here and said, Hey, honey, let's go to Kadoba for lunch after church today. The stage whisperer, that makes it, that means I wanted all of you to know where I was going to lunch today, but I wanted to do it in such a way that you thought I didn't want you to know where I was going to lunch today. <laughs> right? And then so the religious leaders, they, they were experts in stage whispers whenever these sinners gathered to hear Jesus. And they would stage whisper so that they, people would hear what they were saying. They would say things like, oh, he's at it again. There he goes again. Jesus just can't help himself. Driving us crazy. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. He can't be the Messiah. He can't really be a holy man of God. He welcomes sinners and eats with them. And they want everybody to think this is a conversation they're having amongst themselves, but they really want everybody to know, to question what Jesus is doing. And they want these people who are outsiders that Jesus is leading to believe can become insiders to question whether or not Jesus can really make them insiders if they're already outsiders. Now, you know how sometimes if you hear somebody stage whispering near you like that, the best course of action is not to pay any attention to it? But you know how sometimes when somebody does that, it gets you right here? And before you know it, you've turned around and you are prepared in as Christian a way as you can to dole out a dose of truth. As you see. And I think that's a bit of what happened to Jesus on this occasion. He was aware of what they were saying, and he decides to speak some truth to them. And he tells three stories by way of answering the question they were asking, but not really asking. Because the question they wanted an answer for is, why are you doing this? Why are you always partying with these people? Why are you always eating with them? Why are you always encouraging them to come out to hear you? Why? And so he tells them three stories to answer the question. They have probably three, apart from the story of the Good Samaritan, probably three of the most famous stories in the whole of Scripture. And in the first story, Jesus talks about a shepherd and a sheep. It says, hey, if any of you were a shepherd, you know that if you got your sheep to an open, open, safe place in a pasture where they could feed, and you went to count them, and you realized that you only had 99 out of the 100, if you were a good shepherd, you know that you would leave the 99 in the open, safe pasture, and you would go and find the one that was lost. When you found it, you would put it on your shoulders, you would carry it back, and when you got it back, like, you'd celebrate a little bit. Right? Now this is hard for us to understand because in America today we live in a waste culture. We throw things away easily and devalue things quite a bit. So imagine it this way to help you understand what Jesus is getting at here because any good shepherd would have done this. And in America we would say, well, one's gone, she's still got 99, just buy another. 
right? That's not the way it works. Imagine that you have a dog who has a litter of puppies, has eight puppies, and the puppies are out in your backyard playing one day. And let's imagine you've also got some kids who love those puppies. And the eight puppies are out playing, and one of the eight puppies gets out of the lawn and goes missing. Not a single parent in this place would look at their little three or four year old and say, hey, you've got seven more puppies, get over it. <laughs> and everybody in the family will now search for the one puppy that's missing. And when you find the one puppy that's missing, you'll bring it back to the lawn. You'll probably lay down in the grass, let all the puppies climb all over you, and everybody will be happy and jolly and celebrate. That's the point of Jesus' story. It's the same thing that he's saying about the sheep and, the, and their shepherd here. And probably at this point, the religious leaders are kind of going, they just say this out loud, and I can imagine this is what they're thinking. Okay, duh. What does that have to do with the question we want you to answer? And so Jesus gives them the moral of his story. You know how Aesop's fables, tortoise and the hare and whatnot, lion and the mouse, they all have a, a moral, a point. Jesus' parables were the same way. Sometimes he said what they were, more often than not, you just had to figure it out on your own. Think a little. Jesus liked people to think, you see. And so Jesus gives them, but he gives them the moral to this story. And he says this. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing over one sinner who repents. Now it would have been bad enough if he'd stopped there. But then he says this. Then over 99 righteous people who do not need to repent. And, and Jesus, in other words, is saying, look guys, God is like the shepherd in this story. When a member of the flock or a part of the flock is lost, God's focus is not on the 99 he's got. It's on the ones who aren't there because the flock is not whole without the one that's not there. And so all of God's interest shifts to the one that's not there. And God goes searching for the one that's not there. And when God finds the one that's not there, he brings the one that's outside back inside. And when he gets the one that was outside inside, God and the heavenly beings, the angels, party better than a bunch of tax collectors and sinners. And it's hard for us because Jesus is essentially saying that God might just find it more pleasurable when one sinner finds him today than he does when all 350 of us here this morning sing a praise song. And so Jesus is basically saying, I'm eating with the sinners. I'm hanging out with the tax collectors and the prostitutes and all those folks because it is what God sent me to do. Period. So he, he tells the story of the shepherd and the sheep. Then he goes to a story about a woman and her wages. He says, hey guys, there was this woman and she had 10 points, 10 silver points, a drachma, is what each one would have been called. The, a drachma was roughly a day's wages for a day laborer back in Jesus' day. So this one in her hand has got, she thinks she should have 10 drachma, 10 days worth of pay. And when she goes to count the, the coins in her hand, she finds that she's only got nine out of 10. Now this is hard for us to understand because when we think of 10 pennies, if you lose one penny, you don't care. You lose 10 pennies, you don't really care. You have 10 dimes and lose 10 dimes and not really care. Right, now let, let me just challenge you. If your employer leaves a day's wages off your paycheck, you will go looking for it. And when he restores it, you will celebrate. And you will say what a nice guy he is or what a nice lady she is. And she says that's what this woman did. She had lost one of, a part of her wages, perhaps. And she gets out of her room and her dust cloth and she cleans and she cleans and she cleans until she finds the one day's wage that was missing. And when she finds the wage that was missing, she has a little celebration like you do when you find your lost keys. A little celebration. Right? And Jesus does, they're wondering, what's this all about Jesus? And Jesus gives them the moral of the story again. And he says something quite similar. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. In other words, Jesus is saying, when one is missing, God's energy goes to the one that's missing. God's passion goes to the one that's missing. And God searches for it till he finds it. And when God finds the one that is outside and brings it inside, God and the heavenly beings party better than a tax collector and a bunch of sinners. Jesus says, you, you want to know why I'm eating with the sinners? You want to know why I choose to hang out with prostitutes and tax collectors instead of rabbis and priests? Because who God sent me to be with? Amen. Who God sent me to? So you get the shepherd and the sheep, then he talks about a woman and her wages, and finally he talks about a father and his two sons. 
not twin sons, but an older son and a younger son. And Jesus' story goes something like this. There was a younger son, 18, 19, maybe 20 years old. I'm going to fill in some blanks as I tell this. He goes to his daddy, and he says to his daddy, Daddy, I want my share of what you're going to give me when you die. His share would have been about a third. The estate would have gone two-thirds of it to his older brother, and the law dictated that a half of two-thirds go to him, which was the other one-third. He says, Daddy, I want you to give me what I'm going to get when you die, which is really crass, isn't it? Because he's sort of saying, Daddy, I want to go and live like you're dead. So the father gives him what, what he's got coming to him as much as he can, and the son goes off to a foreign land. And in the foreign land, he spends his money on wild living. <laughs> the old timers call this licentiousness. It's <laughs> like, kind of fun, but really bad for you. Like, really, really bad for you. And does that sound like the tax collectors, by the way? Working for the foreigners, wasting everything they made on bad living, wild living. So the son's in the foreign land, and he's just blowing his money left and right. Anything he wants to do, he's doing it. And because he's young and ignorant, he spends it all. And that would have been okay, except that nature worked against him about the same time, and a famine came to the land. And this put him in really bad shape. And after a few days of having no money, he's starving. He has to find work. Now, this is a good Jewish boy. He's never eaten ham. He's never fried bacon. He's never touched a pig. Because good Jews don't do that. The law says don't do that. Even if you go to Israel today, there's only a couple of pig farms. I think they're up in the Golan Heights. And the pigs have to be kept on boarded pasture. So they don't touch the Holy Land. So they don't, he picks, he doesn't have anything to do with pigs, but the only job he can find is take care of pigs. Like he's got to feed the pigs these pods called carrot pods and slop that they typically ate. And so he takes up this job, living, working in the pig pen, feeding the pigs. Like a good Jewish boy can't go any lower than this. But guess what? He's not being paid enough to buy food to eat. And so apparently he says to the guy who owns the pig pen, hey, can I have some of the stuff you're giving to the pigs? And the foreign guy goes, no, you can't. That's for the pigs. And so he's in the pig pen, covered in pig, piggy fecal matter. And not able to eat piggy food. And he's in rough shape. And finally, for apparently the first time in several months, he actually has a sensible fault. And the thought strikes him that it would be better to be the lowest of the lowly servant in my daddy's house than it is to be the lowest of the lowly servant in this place. I think I'm going to go home and cast myself on the mercy of daddy and say, daddy, I will become a day laborer in your house. Day laborer meant the, one, one of the people, poor people, who showed up to see if there was work for them that day. If there was work, they worked. If there wasn't, they didn't work and didn't get paid that day. That's what he was willing to do. So he sets out for home. Now, in my sort of imaginary version of this story, the father's life on the porch in a rocking chair of some big Georgian southern plantation style house, right? <laughs> and he looks out the road, out the drive and out the road, like looking outside of Augusta National. And he looks out and he sees somebody coming. And he recognizes almost immediately who it's coming. And he takes off out of his rocker, down the stairs, toward the person who is coming because he recognizes that it's the sun. Now he gets to the sun, and you need to remember, this boy is covered in fecal matter. This boy's clothes are tattered. He stinks. He doesn't have any shoes anymore. He has been hanging out with pigs. There may not be enough ritual bathing to ever get him religiously clean ever again. It's true. The father gets to him and the father doesn't stop. Like, oh. Pig mess, buddy. The father runs right into him. And embraces him. And the boy starts to give his spiel. Daddy, I'll be the lowest of the lowly servants. And before he can even finish, the father's like, let's go back to the house, son. Mm -hmm. And gets him back to the house. 
And it's like off go the tattered clothes and on comes the new robe and his sandals are gone. He gets new sandals. He gets a ring on his finger, maybe with a signet of the family on it to indicate that he's a son in the household once again. And he is restored to his full rights as, as the younger son in the household. And the daddy says to the servant, hey, you know that fatted calf we've been saving probably for Feast of Tabernacles? It's like the biggest celebration out of the year that the Jewish folks have. We would go ahead and kill that calf now to celebrate. And Jesus, at this point in the story, doesn't give a moral to the story. And I think he doesn't because the moral's really clear on its own, isn't it? Jesus goes to those who are outside, who need to come inside. And he invites the outsiders to come inside. Jesus invites the outsider to come in even when the outsider is a rascally scoundrel, stinky pig feces covered younger son. If you're outside, Jesus chooses you to be an insider. Now let me just pause right here because some of you in this place may have a sense that you are the kind of person that religious people just don't know what to do with you. You don't meet their expectations. You don't have half your Bible highlighted. You don't know whether to pray to God, the Father, the Son, or the Holy Spirit anymore. Like what do you do? Just draw that out of my hat and go for it. You just you may not know. Some of you are outsiders to all of this. As a matter of fact, some of you are such outsiders to all of this that right now, even though you're inside of this space, everything in you wants to run outside of it. To get away from this place where you feel like you don't belong. And I just want to say, if there's any of you in this place this morning, I just want to say, Jesus chooses you. Doesn't choose me. I've been inside for a while. Doesn't choose our elders. They've been inside a long time. Deacon's been inside a while. Staff been inside a while. He chooses those who are in this place who feel like they're still, even though inside or on the outside, looking in. But Jesus chooses you. And all that Jesus is really asking of you in return is that you choose him. And the restoration begins from there. Along the way, you'll learn who to pray to. Long way your Bible will get underlined. It'll all happen. That's where it begins. Because Jesus chooses outsiders for the inside. Now the story goes on, and it moves from the younger son to the older son. The older son has apparently been out in the fields working. This is what he always did. Like he had been at home the whole time. He had never left. He had never asked for a share. He was waiting for dad to die, like a good son's supposed to. Right? He's working on everything. He's tending the fields. He's taking care of the workers. He's pitching in where stuff needs to be done and nobody knows how to do it. I mean, he's a good son. He's doing exactly what he thinks he's supposed to do to keep his father pleased. And he comes in from the fields, and as he draws near the house, he's like, I hear music. I hear that it sounds like revelry. <laughs> Daddy didn't tell me there's a party today. And so a servant comes out of the house about this time. And he says to the servant, what in the world is going on in there? And the servant says, man, <laughs> your younger brother has come home. Your daddy has killed the fattened calf and they are partying like his 2000 all over again. <laughs> you, and, and it's almost a sense in which the servant said, you just got to come in. <laughs> But the son doesn't get excited. He becomes pea green with envy. That brother of mine, he's been off hanging out with prostitutes, which is an interesting comment. How did he know that? It's almost as if it's possible in Jesus' story that the older brother knew exactly where the younger brother was, knew exactly what he was doing, and never did a darn thing about it. Been hanging out with prostitutes. Blowing the money, acting like dad's dead. I've been here, he actually says this, I've been here slaving away for daddy. 
which is an interesting perspective on his father. His, his father's a slave master instead of his dad. And the father's inside, and apparently there's a point at which the father's like, wait a minute, something's missing. But, but one of my sons is not here. <laughs> and I love this, because you see what's happened in the story of Jesus. The, outs, the son, the younger son who is the outsider, has become the insider. And now the older son who is the insider has made himself the outsider. And you know what the father does? He does what God always does for those who are outside of what he's doing inside. He goes to them to find them. And Jesus in his telling of the story basically says that daddy pleaded with the boy to come. And the boy listed his complaints. And Jesus' story ends without him ever telling us whether or not the older boy went into the party. And Jesus doesn't offer a moral to the story because it's pretty clear. Jesus is hanging out with sinners, and prostitutes, and tax collectors, and all those people because it's what his father sent him to do. Because it's what his father sent him to do. Jesus chooses outsiders for insiders. He chooses outsiders for insiders, even when the outsiders are scoundrelish, rascally younger sons. And he chooses outsiders for insiders, even when the outsiders are stubborn, hard-headed, hard-hearted, religious prigs, that's P-R-I-G, with <laughs> who are sons. Some people heard me say something else in the first service. It's like, what C.S. Lewis said the word, it's okay. <laughs> Just means a self righteous jerk. No matter who's outside, Jesus is choosing the outsiders for the inside. Now, this is challenging for those of us who've been on the inside for a long time. You know, a funny thing can happen to those of us who've been following Jesus for a long time. We can actually forget that we're following Jesus. And we become religious, and I mean religion in the bad way. It's a good way to think about religion, too. But we become religious. And we don't know what to do anymore with people who don't act religious like we do. And then we find that Jesus does something where he's choosing outsiders for insiders. And we thought we were the insiders, but the outsiders he's bringing in don't look like who we do as insiders. They don't act like who we are as insiders. And it just blows our mind. And it blows our mind to the point that we actually end up finding we aren't following Jesus anymore because we can't handle Jesus' habit of making the outsiders insiders, which always makes some insiders a little uncomfortable. Hey, listen, if you're religious, Jesus is going to rock your apple cart. <laughs> he's not just going to rock it. He's going to turn it over and fill it up again with what belongs in it. Right. I, last November, dozens of people showed up at a city park in Kansas City. Most of them were church people. They would go to church on Sunday morning, then they would go home and fill their picnic baskets with main dishes, fried chicken, casseroles, side dishes, salads, vegetables, desserts, breads, jugs of sweet tea and lemonade, and as the weather got colder, those big thermoses of hot chocolate and coffee. And they would go to this city park, and they would open up their baskets, and they would all have a picnic. Here's picture of it. But they weren't just picking. What made this different from the average church picnic is their whole point in doing this was that the homeless people of the city of Kansas City could come to the park and share in the picnic with them. And so you would get dozens of these people who brought the picnic baskets and dozens more homeless people who would show up in the park to share lunch with them on Sunday after church. This had been going on for several Sundays until a Sunday last November. They're all out having their picnics like this. And a few police cars pull up. And a few cars from the public health department, the Kansas City Health Department, pull up. And the police get out, and they're kind of marking the perimeter, and they're just there to watch and make sure nothing gets out of hand. But the health inspector and all of her army of officials get out of their cars, and they have their papers, and they're showing their papers, and they're marching through the park. No kidding, guys, as they go through the park, they're taking casserole dishes and main dishes and plates of half-eaten food and marching them to the center of the park and dumping it all in a pile. When they had gotten everybody's food into the pile, the health inspector goes back to one of the cars, opens up the trunk, 
and officials go to her car and they all start giving out bottles of Clorox. And they go back to the pile of food in the center of the park, open up the Clorox bottles and bleach the food so no one else can keep eating it. Now this has created quite a brouhaha, as you might imagine. And the reason the people were given that this had to happen was that it was an illegal feeding. That the food had not been prepared in licensed industrial kitchens. And therefore posed a poison risk to the homeless people who were eating. Now one of the city councilmen became really irate about this. And out of his own pocket, he paid for an investigation. What he found beneath the surface was that people who lived in the neighborhoods around that park were calling the city councilman and the police department complaining like mad every Sunday about all of these outsiders who were now inside of their neighborhood. And listen guys, some of their complaints were complaints we could share. Most of us as nice middle class American people. I mean, they were, they were, some of them felt like really valid complaints. They were like, look, the reality is almost, almost 90% of America's homeless people are severely mentally ill or drug addicted. They pose a, a, a safety risk to our children if our children want to go play in the park. They pose a risk to the elderly people who live in our neighborhood. And they would say things like that, but we all know what was really going on, right? Property values. Like if somebody wanted to put a sign up on their house tomorrow, they can't ask as much for it or won't sell it if somebody finds out homeless people are hanging out in the park all day on Sunday. And listen, we can put that down, but the reality is most of us would think quite similarly. At least would be tempted to. Like, I can understand what the neighbors were thinking. But guys, I cannot, as I, as I read that and thought about that story, I cannot get through my mind that in spite of how much I might feel the way those neighbors felt, I couldn't see Jesus agreeing with me. I always kept seeing Jesus inside the park, eating casseroles and fried chicken, and drinking tea, none of which had been prepared in a licensed industrial kitchen. I kept seeing Jesus like if the food ran out, multiplying some casseroles and sweet tea to make sure everybody got fed. <laughs> kept seeing Jesus sitting on blankets, laughing with homeless people, listening to their stories, listening to the stories of the people who were serving the food and their hearts about serving the food and laughing and crying and enjoying the people who were in there. And then I kept seeing Jesus noticing that health inspector, all of her officials and the police and all of the neighbors on the outside of the park. And I kept seeing Jesus going to them and telling them a story about a shepherd and a sheep and a woman and her lost day's wages and a father and his two sons and saying, I would just love it if you would come inside. Because Jesus chooses outsiders or insiders. Whether the outsider is a scoundrel or a son or a self-righteous religious critic, Jesus chooses outsiders or insiders. And knowing that, the question for those of us who've been following Jesus for a long time, who've been inside for a long time, knowing that's the way Jesus works, the question for us is, do we still choose Jesus? So here's what we're going to do. I want to give you just a few minutes to ask the Holy Spirit to convict you. That means to pinpoint something for you that needs to be adjusted and worked on in your heart. And so here's what I want you to ask Jesus. I want you to say, Jesus, who is the person, if maybe something you know personally, who is the person or who is the group of people that if I saw you eating a meal with them, I would have to think twice before I came in even though you were there. And so Father, would you come down in these few minutes in the power of your Holy Spirit that if there are people in groups like that for us, and as there are people in groups like that for us, we just ask you, Father, in the power of your Spirit, to put your thumb right on that for us. To make us really, really aware of it.